So we'll immediately start with our topic for today, which is best practices in teaching intermediate advanced ELLs. And let me move on. Okay, so we'll start with a short presentation of our subject matter expert, Jacqueline Seijo. Before becoming an ESL instructor, Jacqueline worked in the field of architecture and design internationally in Spain, and she returned to Canada in 2013. Since 2017, she has been teaching ESL to newcomers to Canada with the Ottawa Catholic School Board, to local Francophone students at Collège La Cité, and to international students at Algonquin College. Since the onset of the pandemic, she was appointed at Tech Support Lead in ESL and Link at the Ottawa Catholic School Board. The bulk of her experience is with CLB 7 to 9 or high intermediate levels, which she thoroughly enjoys teaching. Incorporating technology, guest speakers, and current events into the classroom engages students deeply and enriches the learning and teaching experience. So this is our presenter, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, Jacqueline. It's a great pleasure to have, have you with us. Thank you. So let's start with our first introductory questions. The very first one. What do you miss, if anything, about teaching face-to-face -face pre COVID-19? I'll give the floor to Jacqueline first, and then all of you will have a chance to participate. Jacqueline, what do you miss? What do I miss uh, about teaching face-to-face uh, -face before COVID? What I miss especially, I would say, is um, the sensory contact and the senses, essential experience with, with, with students, so appealing to the five senses. So touching the handouts, uh, tasting the food that sometimes students bring into class and share. Um, seeing how students, learners engage with each other before class, they're, they're doing their small talk during breaks, um, et cetera. And maybe after class, they'll come and ask me a question and uh, maybe share some something or other and ask for advice perhaps. Um, hearing, hearing them, the bustling going on before class during break and, and the smell of their delicious snacks and um, coffee and teas, etc. Um, yeah, so especially the the what 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 is sensory uh, related to the senses <clears throat> is something that really uh, that I really miss um, versus teaching online. Um, I also miss the interaction with the students and well, seeing their body language and them seeing my body language, which is very hard to do when we uh, when we are uh, teaching online and learning online. And this is just about, oh, well, touching, of course, all well, the touching of the, the handouts, the brochures, the realia that we sometimes bring to class to, uh, to enhance our, our teaching and, and learning. And what do you think? Oh, I'd like to listen to the rest of you. What, uh, what, do you, what does uh, everyone else miss about pre-COVID-19? Um, pre Okay, everyone, so if you'd like to respond to this question, please remember to raise your hand. I don't mean in real life, but I mean click the button. To get there, click on participants in your taskbar and then click on raise hand, it's a little blue button. Um, so I will go and check and see if we have anyone with their hands up. And we do, we have Michelle Wooding Andrade. So please give us your response. I can totally endorse everything that Jacqueline said. I miss the potlucks. Because <laughs> um, I think the shared cultural experiences from Colombia, you have your um, arepas, you have people bringing in their Iranian foods. It was just always something fantastic. Brazilians, we found your queso. Um, and even on Fridays, we would tend to have um, these kind of breakfast clubs. So that's something I really, I really miss and cherished pre-COVID, or as they say, BC, before COVID. <laughs> yeah. I love that. It's a very nice one. Uh, thanks so much, Michelle. Um, currently, I don't see anyone with their hand up, but someone in the chat, I think it was Nina's, made an awesome comment here, but contact with learners. I think we can all agree. Just walking to the classroom and seeing someone was so nice. Thank you. 
I will wait a couple of moments for someone else to raise their hand or to write a comment. And if not, I'll let you know we can move on, Loretta, okay? Sure, thank you. Yeah, I think we're good to go. We can go to the next question. Of course, we covered so many bases, right? Okay, so I'm trying to present here. Yeah, okay. Sorry. So the other question we have is, are your learners as engaged as they were pre-COVID-19 now? Why or why not? So this is our second question for you, Jacqueline. Learner engagement. Um, I, I would safely say they are as engaged or perhaps more engaged. Um, and this was something that I was not expecting at all when uh, the pandemic broke out, um, that this would be possible to engage them more than face-to-face. -face. But I see that it is, it is possible and it's uh, very exciting to see <laughs> and very interesting. Almost an experiential experience, <laughs> uh, pardon the redundance. Um, uh, so they are as or more engaged uh, because we are using technology technology. Um, they are learning online. I'm teaching them online. So technology is at the heart and core of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, the, of course, delivery. So um, as an instructor or as instructors, we are constantly looking for the best tools, the best uh, educational technology tools to use to, to maximize their engagement, to optimize their learning and their participation in the class, and to get the most out of the, the, the online learning experience. It is very challenging, as we all know. It is extremely challenging. Um, and very much because of what we answered to the first question, that, that, that sensorial experience, that um, uh, reading each other's body language, giving presentations and, you know, in, in front of the class, this is something that is, uh, is hard to do <laughs> online. But perhaps during the course of this session, we can delve a little bit deeper into how and why students perhaps uh, or can be or are, in, uh, in my experience, more engaged after COVID, post-COVID. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, so far, I don't see anybody in uh that has their hand up but i do have a couple of comments here so from earlier judy said um that what she misses about face to face is the eye to eye contact when students turn off their camera it can't tell if they are still with her and i think that's a great point right with with online we have the ability to just say oh, i'm done with you today i don't want to have my camera on and i can mute myself and you won't even know i'm there so thank you judy um, that's a great point. We have Gordon with uh, their hand up. So please, Gordon, feel free to unmute. Hi. Hi. Hi I've, I'm finding that uh, students are very isolated and don't have much of an opportunity to practice their English these days. So they seem very keen when we connect uh, on Zoom usually. Um, it might be the first time that week that they've had an opportunity to practice their English. They're not, they're not meeting people randomly and having an opportunity to exercise their English skills like previous to the COVID quarantine. Thank you so much, uh, Gordon. That's an excellent point, right? Like, depending on where your students are located, they may not have anyone else to be speaking with. I know um, I have spoke with some international students, I think it was last year in the springtime, who were isolated here. They, didn't, they weren't quite sure if they could go home or if they should stay. And it was a really weird time for them. So having someone like a teacher or an instructor they can go online to and just say, hi, I'm happy to see your face. That's so important. So thank you, Gordon. That's wonderful. Uh, let's see if anyone else has their hand up at this time. I don't see anyone else. I will check the comment. Judy, just, Judy, you just raised your hand, oh, right? Yes. yes. Please unmute. Uh, okay. I think I have to press it now to put my hand down again, I think. So uh, just to his point um, about not having contact, I, I feel it's really important for all the students to, and maybe everybody does this already, but for the students to connect with each other via some 
other platform or medium, for example, if they have a WhatsApp group, then they can communicate with each other outside class and they can be encouraged to chat together. The other day I was talking to some of the students and I, we were talking about where they lived in the city. And there were five students who said, oh, I live right near Kiel and Finch too. And oh, I live around the corner. So it was interesting for them to actually learn this because it doesn't come up in the online class. Where, do you, where are you coming from? How long did it take you to get here? So if you raise it within the class, it actually allows them to connect a little bit better. Maybe they could go for a walk with each other. It's a possibility. Love that. That's great. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, anybody else? I've noticed a couple of us are having some issues with the raise hand, but perhaps we could all try one more time to practice the raise hand just before we move on. So your taskbar, it's that bar that says mute, stop video. So if you find your taskbar, there's a little box that says participants. If you click there, it'll open a window, usually on your right hand side, and you'll see there will be a bunch of little options, little buttons. The first option is a little blue hand and it says raise hand. So if you click there, I get a notification. It says that your name has raised their hand. So for example, when Loretta does it, I see that she's raised her hand and that way I can call on her. So if for some reason you can't find it, let me know in the chat and I'll call on you there instead, but try your best to use the blue raise hand if you can. Okay, thank you everybody. Okay, let me just check the chat again. I don't see anybody with their hand up right now, um, but I think that those are some great responses. I think we can probably move on now, Loretta. Sure. Okay, and we'll move on to our conversation questions. Um, so let's start with how, the how. How do you get your students to interact or engage online? And I guess some of us touch base on that, uh, but we'll need to go on deeper now. So how do you get your students to interact or engage online? Jacqueline? Yes, thank you, uh, Lorena. Um, so to get students to interact online, they have to be invited to do something interesting. So then that is engagement. Um, so what I do, what I do, um, what, what I've been doing from since I started teaching, um, just putting myself in the shoes of the learner. Um, I need to know why I'm going to class. So there has to be some kind of motivation. Uh, well, for them, of course, it's the need to learn English, to improve their English, to land a job, to further their education. That is motivation in itself, but it's much more than that. Um, as children like to play, adults like to play as well and learn as they play. So if that's, if that's something that we can introduce and use and implement in our through our lessons through our teaching um, including a lot of fun in the class and then seeing how that fun translates into learning that is ideal and that is what I call a celebration so making each class a celebration like a party <laughs> um, so what what I think is very important is that learning outcomes are always clarified and clear from the beginning. And this is of course based on the needs assessments that we deliver and surveys that we launch. And so we have, um, so having students own their learning and their, uh, their classroom experience, take ownership uh, through the needs they expressed at the beginning of the course and, and during the course as well. Um, <clears throat> so those needs need to be matched with fun experiences. And it's not only about playing a game or doing a kahoot. Well, yes, why not? But <clears throat> I think it goes beyond that. There should be, um, well, in, in, my, in, my, in my opinion and in my experience, um, what's necessary is uh, that there's a backbone, uh, a strong outline and structure and vision of what the course is about, what, what the learning outcomes are. So as they have that fun, as they... Um, as they participate in each activity through, through a lesson, they know why they're doing that. So this is what I think is the key to engagement, that they know in every single thing they do, they know the roadmap. So they know where they're going 
through everything they do. And uh, this has to be meaningful, of course. So there has to be um, a rationale and um, a meaningfulness to, to, to what they do towards that learning outcome. So um, that's, I think that would, that's my, my, my answer. Now I'll leave, uh, I'll leave a question to the rest of you. All right, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, don't forget that if you'd like to participate, you don't only have to speak out loud, you can also write in the chat box if you have a question about a topic related to this, or if you have a comment about what someone else has said, please feel free to write that in the chat box as well. Um, so I'm currently looking through the list. I don't see anyone with their hands up as of yet, which is great. But uh, actually, Jacqueline, I have a question about this topic. With intermediate and advanced students, they kind of have a higher proficiency. And certain games, not that they're juvenile, but we kind of, maybe they won't work as well with this group. What kind of engagement or, or games or gamification do you find works best with this group? Um, so the, the gamification, um, I use scavenger hunts a lot, digital scavenger hunts uh, to tie in together different aspects of what we're covering and even to elicit what's coming. So we can use scavenger hunts to that respect as well. Uh, scavenger hunts can cover grammar topics, they can cover vocabulary, they can cover news, anything related to what, we're, what the lesson is about and the content um, and the subject matter. Scavenger hunts is something that they can do in groups. They can play as a group, that's the idea. So as a, as a team, participating in, as, a, as a team, all well, becomes a competition and uh, there's negotiation involved. There are many, many skills involved in, in, such, a, in such an activity. Um, other, I wouldn't say they're games, but I'd call it collaboration. So I'm a big fan of collaboration, getting students to work on one, a single document anytime from anywhere. Um, so we're just gonna come to that in, in the next couple of questions and, and then building to the end of the session. Uh, so I don't wanna get into that yet. But um, so basically, yeah, the, the games uh, that are used in the class or that, that I use in class are usually played in teams. Mm. Teams is the, one of the key words, <laughs> one of the key concepts and, and group work. Love that. So whatever is done is done as a group, as a team. You know what, maybe we'll turn it to everyone else that's here as well. Perhaps in the chat, we can make a list of some activities or games that you do with this level um, intermediate slash advanced that you find works well. Perhaps we could type some examples in the chat together. I'll keep my eye out and I'll say them out loud when they come in. So one is a scavenger hunt that Jacqueline just mentioned. Ooh, Michelle says debates. That is a very, very cool example. Any other ones? Hey, I'll keep my eye open on that. I'm um, just checking back in the participants list to see if anyone has their hand up. I don't see that right now. So, so far we have scavenger hunts and debates, which is really awesome. Before we move on, is there, are there any other ideas or activities? All right. I'll pass it over to you, Loretta. Oh, sorry, want to interrupt. Uh, Kanita, I'm sorry if I mispronounced her name, but Kanita says quizzes. That's a really cool idea. Padlet, Padlet's awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay, Loretta, I'll pass it over to you now. Okay, so let's move on to our next question. And yeah, there are many great ideas out there. Um, so the next question we have for you uh, is, do you teach the four skills separately or do you integrate them? We also need some examples to share here with one another. So Jacqueline, well, let's start with you and then with everybody else. If you could unmute yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. So as to this question is regarding for the four skills, if, they're if I teach them separately or integrated. Yes. Uh, integrated. Um, to this day, I have no clue how to teach writing without reading or listening without speaking or, or vice versa. So um, what I do is I integrate skills. 
I, maybe as most of us do. Um, so when we're when we're assessing a certain skill, of course we're look we're looking for um, a certain. Um, we're, we're, we use a rubric. Uh, we'll usually use a rubric, and we are uh, we're assessing certain aspects of a skill, hmm? competencies. But I don't teach a single skill in isolation. Uh, language is built on the four skills and many other skills. So to this day, and I think I'll never know how to teach just one skill in, in isolation. Um, so integrating skills, uh, you were asking me for some examples. How do... Um, right, so if you could share some examples of how you integrate teaching different skills at once. Yes, for sure. Uh, so the, the way I do this is through project-based uh, learning, PBL, mm -hmm. which um, I'll, I'll just summarize right now because we're going to go deeper into, delve deeper into this. Mm -hmm. So again, students, my students work in, in groups, always, always. I would, well, I would say 95% of the time. Um, so I use PBL in my, in my courses, project-based learning which is um, organizing the course around several questions, just around the central question that students are asked. I use the same question for all my students. So each students are put into groups and they are given this question. And then, so this question is something they have to explore, research, do research on, uh, find answers to this question. There is no objective answer to these questions, to these central questions. So they will have to research to get together, negotiate, um, create outlines, um, assign roles within their groups uh, to each other. Uh, so they'll be reading, for example. They'll be, when, when they're researching, searching for answers and for, to answer this question, they're doing research. That is reading. So that's real, authentic reading. So. It's not as if they, I just give them a reading exercise. So they read and then answer questions. Not really. So they are reading freely. So it's free reading, research, etc. They are taking notes and that is writing. So they're creating outlines um, and, and answering that question. Then they'll meet again in groups because they're, they're meeting in their groups on and off while they do this uh, preliminary research. Um, and of course, they're, they're listening because they'll be, while doing their research, they're listening to a video, they're listening to maybe a news report. Um, and, uh, and of course, they're speaking to each other. So when they're working in their groups. Uh, so the objective of, um, of a project, a project in, as, as, as PBL, is to give a presentation. So at the, uh, at the end of that um, of that, um, of that timeline or the schedule that's given to them, they will finally will give, give a presentation, a public presentation to, to the whole class uh, with uh, sharing their findings, their maybe their recommendations, if there are recommendations to, to, to share, uh, which, and this will be the result of all that research, all that negotiating um, and uh, managing their time. So there are many skills involved and all the all four skills are involved at at all times. So that's that's integrating skills into into one answering one central question. And this is PBL. Very yes. interesting. Thank you. Yeah, but um, I think that all depends on what you're teaching, right? For example, I've had courses in which I had to teach writing, uh, but I've also remember like years ago I was only had to teach speaking, and, and I know it's hard. It's hard to do, right? Focus on only one skill. Yeah. That's, that's so true, but um, Colleen? Thank you. Um, so I see that the lovely Sandra Palmer has their hand up, so please respond. Okay, let me unmute myself. Yeah, um, I have a slightly different, well, actually I have quite a different experience in my class. Um, I teach IELTS, so um, most of my students are professionals and they obviously want to take IELTS to further their professional careers or go to university here. Um, and uh, like I target my lessons towards specific skills because I do use the IELTS 
um, exams, the booklets that um, Cambridge publishes for, um, for our PBLA, like real life task, right? Like writing the health exam. And so, I mean, we have lots of discussions, um, but most of my lessons are specifically one skill at a time. I mean, it comes together when they're doing their PBLA, whether it's, I mean, obviously, if they're listening, they're also doing a bit of writing. Obviously, for writing tasks one and two, they're reading and writing. Um, but yes, my class isn't project based. And that's, um, that's the nature of it, because I am teaching IELTS. I have, te I have taught seven to nine classes, like non-IELTS. Um, and yes, in those classes, I guess if I think back, that was more project-based. And so I did do more group work. With my IELTS, I do hardly any group. Well, I don't do group work. But we have, lot, like I have 22 students, but um, there's a lot of discussion, or, like every day. So, yeah, so that's just my class. So, um, so in some circumstances, you can teach just skills. Also, again, because it's IELTS, I do a number of lessons on grammar points. Um, because, again, they need the grammar to write the IELTS exam. But anyway, yeah, so. Sandra, thank you. You know what? When you first mentioned that, I said, what do you mean? And then when you went on to explain it, well, first of all, the students write IELTS individually. So what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. But I wonder, I guess maybe I shouldn't say I wonder, I'm just thinking out loud and perhaps some group work, like you talked about discussions, that's a really important part for IELTS too, for listening. So I don't know, maybe a really interesting idea there. Thank you. Um, I'll let me check the participants list to see if anyone else has their hand up. One second. Oh, I don't see anyone as of yet. Let me check the chat. So Gunnell agrees and Gunnell says, makes sense. Uh, from earlier, Chris Watts, uh, the previous question about um, how can you engage students? Um, Chris says, give each student a topic to lead a class and that's accountability. I wanna mention that comment because that's really important. Accountability, especially for intermediate advanced um, English language learners, really great point. So thank you so much, Chris. Colleen, we have Gordon. Oh, awesome, Gordon, please go ahead. Okay, um, I was just going to say that um, what I hear most frequently is this students want help with listening and comprehension. Um, I guess maybe this goes back to COVID situation where they may have fewer face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interactions and they may be on the telephone or or dealing with people remotely, and they're having trouble comprehending instructions or requests or issues having to do with medical appointments, all that kind of thing. So I've been trying to, I've been trying, I've been trying to work through ways to help uh, the students understand um, kind of colloquial, reduced English, and I focused a lot on that breaking it down as much as possible and then practicing having them make sounds. That seems to have been very important. I mean, you know, we have our own, we have our own standards and things that we're trying to get the students to do. But if I listen to them very often, this is the biggest issue for them right now. Thank you, Gordon. I'm just wondering, thinking out loud, do your students feel that their listening is being impacted because they only hear through a computer? I wonder if that has anything to do with it. Computers and telephone. Yeah. For sure. I mean, um, students um, almost, I guess all of my students are Arabic speaking and they're all uh, relatively uh, new Canadians. And so they're dealing with uh, medical issues. They're dealing with um, social services and both on the phone and through Zoom. So they're really struggling to make those kinds of basic connections. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Thank you so much, Gordon, such an interesting idea. Um, okay, I don't see anyone else with their hand up in the chat. Let me just double check really quickly. 
No, I think we're good to move on, Loretta. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just wanted to add, even if it's a live conversation with somebody, it's through a mask, right? So it's also that obstacle that does not help students listen properly to the sound. It is challenging for sure. Yeah, thank you, everybody. So uh, let's continue with our other question. Uh, what are your favorite go-to ad tech tools for teaching online? So here we'll talk about technology. So Jacqueline, what's your experience here? My favorite go-to ad tech tools, um, especially since uh, the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, I guess that's what we're, uh, we're looking at right now. Um, my favorite ad tech tools are Google Slides. So what I use in, in my, my, my courses um, to build my lessons and share uh, with students is Google Slides. Um, so typically I, I create a module and then I create lessons uh, within that module. Each lesson is a set of Google Slides. Those Google Slides are hyperlinked to multiple resources. Um, they're hyperlinked to videos, to audios, to uh, news, news articles, for example, they're hyperlinked to a Google form. Um, so at, at some point, the, the stu students will be quizzed on, on what they've been covering. So the link to the Google form will be at some point within those that set of slides. And sometimes that Google form will be, it could be a reading um, uh, part of a news article. And it's, it's a, that's actually a reading exercise with questions for them to answer. Uh, and my, me as the instructor, I will see their results, of course, in that Google form. And then those results, what I often do is I share them with, with students um, on a, in, by, by video conference. So in a, in a video con conference like, like this, we use Google Meet. Uh, we don't use Zoom. But on a Google Meet, I would share the results. So without giving names, of course, I would just share the, the graphics of the results of a, of a quiz for example, with them, and maybe even use them to, um, to ask them well, uh, to elicit some, some reflection, ask them to, well, to, to share as a group, well, what do you think of these results? Or maybe answering a question that maybe 50% of the class had wrong. Um, so all these, all these resources are opportunities to teach and to learn. So again, Google Forms, is um, Google Forms is an app used to create surveys and to and to create quizzes. Now it goes beyond that or just that at face value. So Google, uh, when, when when we have responses in a Google Form, we are able to see the graphics of the results uh, to and the answers to every question. So why not use that as a resource in itself? to get students to describe those graphs as a group um, and analyze trends perhaps, et cetera. Um, so I was saying Google Slides with hyperlinks, <clears throat> with links within the Google Slides to all sorts of resources is, uh, is basically my, my go-to ed tech tool. Um, and together with, um, I mentioned Google Forms, yes. Mm -hmm. How about the rest of you? What are your favorite go-to ed tech um, tools and apps and, and why? Um, so just, I see Sandra's hands up. I'm gonna come to you, but I wanna let everyone know I'm making a list in the chat so that after this question is done, we'll all have a copy of it, okay? Uh, so Sandra, please go ahead. Oh, Sandra, I think you're still muted, sorry. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> I'm used to uh, Google Meets. <laughs> Zoom is a little bit different. <laughs> okay. So I work with one of the school boards, Peel, and we're mandated. Like we use Google Classroom and Google Meet. So I post just as you said, I post all my lessons every day on the Google Classroom. And so, you know, I set up a lesson and then have various um, attachments um, that the students can download um, if they have the technology and most of them do. Um, I use Google Docs a lot. Um, I don't use Google Slides that much. I tend to make my lesson, I have a scanner at home, so I scan 
all sorts of information or use Word docs. And then I upload the PDFs and the uh, Word docs into the Google Classroom under each of the lessons. Um, and I usually put my lesson up the day before so they can see it before they come to class the next day. Um, I should also mention, which I didn't before, we're synchronous for two hours and then so half an hour they're working by themselves. So to be truthful, that often doesn't happen because I'm not finished after two hours. And often they ask so many questions that they're not finished after two hours either. So that half an hour that they're supposed to have for working by themselves and me for marking doesn't often work out. But anyway, that's not the, that's not the tool. So Google Docs, Word Docs, uh, PDFs, um, I use a lot of links like to videos and I will show videos and with the IELTS like um, I'll download the recordings and then play, you know, um, via uh, Google Classroom, I can go in and play them and they can listen to them. I use Google Docs for my PBLA, everything, um, because then I can obviously mark it using the Google Doc and send it back to them. So um, Google Classroom is really good that way. And I mean, you can just go back and forth like instantaneously between um, Google Meet, the video conferences and Google Classroom. Um, and I've had outside visitors because, you know, they can just take over the presentation. And I'm sure Zoom is almost, is very similar, just a different platform. Um, I use the stream, we use emails, um, but I guess it's Google Docs, as, apart from the basic platform, which is my favorite right now. Right, Sandra, thank you. That was a wonderful list. I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> that was I forgot you were listing. You probably had a hard time keeping up. <laughs> oh, I got it. I got it. Thank you so much, Sandra. I want to go on now to Verity Stroud. And if I mispronounce your name, I'm so sorry. But Verity here has written eslbits.com and esllab.com. Um, ESL Lab, I'm very familiar with. I actually haven't heard of ESL Bits. So Verity, that's that's really cool. Thank you for that. Uh, Verity also wrote uh, EssentialEnglish.Review. And um, Verity states that there are some resources there and they have great stuff about idioms and grammar. So thank you so much, Verity. Lots of awesome stuff. Michelle put the wonderful, infamous ESL library that we all know and love. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, this is a great list. Thank you all so much for helping us build this. I think it's something that we're going to walk away with today that will all help us. Uh, any other people with their hands up before we move on? Oh, Kanita, Kanita, please. And if I mispronounce your name, please tell me how to pronounce it properly. I'm so sorry. No, no you're saying it uh, okay. perfect, <laughs> perfectly. So I use uh, for in class brainstorming, I use uh, Google Jamboard and also. I'm using uh, a lot the um, uh, Microsoft whiteboard, which is like, uh, because I use a lot of pen and mark writing, underlining those things. Uh, so those two things are really, it's uh, closer to like uh, your writing on the board, something like that. And I also use to create my own exercises, um, like where they can put in and check their answers quickly. There is live worksheet Dot com so you can create your own exercise and they put your answers and they can check right away like when if they have done wrong or right so um, these three I will recommend to you too yeah check the Microsoft uh, board that's great thank you um, lots of great stuff it's so funny because I think is it Gunnel that actually also posted about live worksheets yeah that's great. I actually first learned about it from Gunnel too. She talked to me a little bit about it. Gunnel, I'm wondering, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you like to talk a little bit about live worksheets? Because you um, informed me about them. <laughs> sure, no problem. Uh, actually, I also find this out when I was volunteering at the Tassel Ontario conference. And that was great because I ended up getting a lot of different resources from there. And this one was actually on to go. You don't need prep or anything. Um, it's perfect for speaking or grammar activities. 
anything like that. You just put it in the search engine when you go to liveworksheet.com and on the top right hand side, there is a search engine. So if you look, let's say you're practicing prefixes, right? Prefixes and the worksheets comes out and it has a bunch of them. You just pick the best fits on, you know, your students level, basically lower level, higher level, and also instantly they get the answer as well. Or if you want, it says email to my instructor. So email to your instructor will get the result of the worksheet, or you get it, whatever you prefer as an instructor to do so. But it's very, very helpful. I personally use it since I find out for my online teaching, it's, it's very helpful. That's great. Thank you so much. I like the search function. I think it makes it a lot easier for all. It does. It does for sure. <laughs> you can even download it too, if you want. Yeah. And I, I like that too, right? It gives you options, email or download, because maybe you're not at home. Maybe you're on the go. Who knows? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you can also create your own exercises in it. Your own ah, worksheet. You know? Really? And then yeah. you can share it with everyone else too. Is that how it yeah. works? Yeah. You can share it with everyone else and uh, upload it. Yeah. Thank you. I'm learning from everyone today. Thank you all so much. I want to bring it back to Verity. Uh, Verity says, I find that the links I sent are great for upper levels. And today we are specifically uh, talking about intermediate and advanced. Um, Verity also says, sometimes I find ESL library not challenging enough. That's a really interesting comment. And it, I mean, a lot of places when they think about ESL, they think about literacy or lower level you know, they don't necessarily think about the advanced individuals who just need a little bit more control of the language. So that's an excellent point there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to check the participants list one more time and then we'll move on. Oh, can you touch? You yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, yes. Um, so uh, along with like the Google, all these things, uh, uh, um, what's it, uh, slides or doc. So there's one thing more. It's called Google um, site. So that is a really good tool. Like if you, it won't like, it would be like they can share with, with each other or publicly and whatever they create like a blog or a site. So you can create pages and it will be like there forever. So that is Google site is also a really cool tech tool to go to. Thank you. Can you yeah, I love Google site. It's really cool. I've used it for portfolios before. Uh, like, I like the idea of having students do a blog. That's an awesome idea. So thank you so much. Um, Judy, I see your hands up. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, somebody made a comment about the advanced learners. And what I find is that even though the students may have some of the advanced grammar and some of the advanced vocabulary, especially when it comes to vocabulary, they really don't appreciate how English, native English speakers collocate words. So I try and with difficulty because it involves a, a, a higher level of concentration on the part of the students, a little bit more effort, but to introduce them to the corpus, one corpus or another, and show them, give them a walkthrough and teach them how they can use that to become uh, more skilled detectives of the language so that they're not simply oh, this word means this, and then they fit it together with some, so the verb with some noun that we never put together. So um, I think if they have an appreciation that there is a tool out there that can uh, assist them, it can be very powerful uh, if you can grab their interest and, and teach them even just a little bit in, in terms of how to use it. Thank you, Julie. Uh, I think, more people need to use the corpus. When I learned about that, it blew my mind and I think it's a wonderful tool. Thank Me you. too. Yeah. Um, I don't wanna, I mean, this is a great conversation. I wanna cut it off, but I just wanna mention the people in the chat who are doing awesome work. So, um, sorry, one second. Uh, Verity says Common Lit is awesome. I haven't heard of Common Lit. If anyone wants to tell me a little bit more about that. that have you, Loretta, have you heard of it? Oh yes, I've oh, used it for a long time now and I really love it. And I'm glad that Verity knows about it and loves it too. <laughs> it's an amazing tool. I don't know if you've checked about it, but it's reading based, but I also use it for writing and discussions. So it's a great tool in which you find articles that are published and they are level based. So it starts from third grade. It's American actually, but still. So it's from grade three and upper levels up to uh, grade 12. I guess. And you can use it throughout these levels. And my students love it because it's a great uh, 
it's a great discussion point as well. So they read, they have some comprehension questions, they are ready made. So nothing to do from the side of the, uh, of the instructor. You simply need to check their writing because usually every article has some comprehension questions and the last one is usually a writing piece. Mm -hmm. So you also give the students the opportunity to write and give their feedback on, on the article they read. But after that, I also use it as a discussion point. And uh, so far it has proven successful because they have something to read about and then something to write and discuss about so that is awesome i love it and it, it sounds like it would cut down a lot on teacher preparation time which we all love i love it thank you and you get reports as well as jacqueline was saying you have reports at the end that you can use right so it, it's it's really nice i love it thank you so much shout out to uh, verity for all these awesome uh, ed tech tools thank you so much um gunnel says readworks.org great for reading thank you so much gunnel um, I also see here TED Talks. Um, they have lots of talks that have writing in it too. There's different lengths and times listed. That's an awesome and great point. Uh, and then uh, Kenita says englishforeveryone.org. And lastly, we have Verity who mentions a CBC podcast. Sorry, podcast. Uh, so thank you so much. If you want to keep adding in some ed tech tools, do not feel like you have to stop. This is an awesome list we're growing here but I think that we should move on. Have you explored collaborative activities or projects? If so, share some examples or experience. And the other question is, do you think collaborative activities or projects enhance the learning experience? If so, in what ways? I'm leaving the question here for you to answer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lorela. Uh, yes. Uh, so the answer is yes, I have explored, uh, not only explored, but I use them all the time. Collaborative um, activities and, and, and projects, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so, mm, and you were asking for, mm, so, so in what ways? Yes. Um, so a, collab a collaborative activity is, uh, is an activity in which two or more students or learners work, uh, work together. So instead of doing individual work or just or filling out a worksheet or drilling doing grammar drills or reading a, a text and answering comprehension questions or listening and answering questions individually. So they would do such activities together. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have also some examples of collaborative uh, platforms or apps are, are Google Slides, as I mentioned before, uh, or Google Docs as, as uh, I think it was Sandra mentioned earlier as well, uh, Google Docs. So two or more students can be writing in the same, in, or entering data or text into the same document at the same time. And that is collaboration. So in Google Slides, for example, um, a very interesting experience that we had recently in class, just to give you an, an example, uh, was uh, students were writing a business letter Okay, so I opened, this was a Google slide, uh, Google slide file, and I created a different slide. I created, well, many slides, one slide for each student, for each student, and we were in, we were in, a, in a Google Meet, so we were in a video conference uh, session, and right there on the spot, I opened Google Slides, I shared my screen, I shared the Google Slides document with all, all, all students in the class, this was in real time. This was all done in real time. And I created one slide for each student and I gave it a different color, okay? So that, well, slide one was, uh, I just had them choose their slide. So they went to, to their slide, their choice, wrote their name at the top and started writing a business letter. This of course was related to a project they were working on. Uh, some city, well, two city councilors from the city of Ottawa had visited our class uh, for a Q&A period with, with students. And at this point, they were going to write a draft business letter to their city councilor about some issues going on in their ward. So it was so interesting to see how they were in real time, they were all writing in the same file, well, each student in, in their own slide. So you could see how each slide was growing. And this was happening at the same time. Students could even go into someone else's slide and see what they were writing. Uh, we did group feedback. So I gave group feedback and students would be asking also, uh, so uh, what would I say here and or there, or how would I say this? Or 
and feedback was given to the students uh, as, as a full class, as a whole class. So this is, um, this is just an example. Other examples, well, would be where students are working in groups on the same document and they are actually teaching each other. And again, I used the, the word negotiate earlier. I think that's a very important word. Uh, learning negotiation skills. These are skills that transfer into the workplace, into further education. Um, and that's just one skill that, uh, that I would um, emphasize. Yeah, so, so students teach each other when they collaborate. Um, I think it saves time, it saves time, it saves my time as an instructor. They are working with each other, they are teaching each other, they are guiding each other um, toward well, solving that problem or answering that question or whatever the activity involves. Um, it encourages an exchange of opinion between students and between team members. Um, encourage uh, expression of agreement and disagreement, or I agree with this, I don't agree. And they have to do this politely uh, in a non-conflictive way. So they have to use their expressions that at this level, they should be mastering, okay? Giving opinion, agreeing, disagreeing, persuasion. So persuading each other to do something in one way or another, all this is collaboration. And this is something they can do uh, if they work together. Yes. So I don't know if that answered the question completely, or I'd love to hear what everyone else has to share. I, I loved what you mentioned there. There was this, um, one specific point that you mentioned, and it reminded me if I read something somewhere that said that students take peer feedback better than they take feedback from like an instructor. And when you just mentioned that, I was like, yeah, that totally makes sense to me. You know, somebody that you're working alongside with, and they said, oh, actually, it's like this. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a really nice organic way for that to happen. So thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I'm waiting for hands up. I don't see any as of right now, but it's a little bit early. Let me just check the chat. Don't see any there yet either. Well, that was a great example, Jacqueline. I like that you had everyone working in the same Google Doc, or sorry, in the same Google Slides. That's really interesting. Do you, do you ever wonder if students go to other slides and read what anyone else is typing? That's a great question. I was, <laughs> I was watching, eh? I was watching to see to see, because I knew, because you know who is who is where, you know. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fun, yeah. And this is all in real time. So instead of so, for example, we went over in that lesson. We we were we had gone over the parts of a business letter, you know, the the uh, salutation, the internal address, the all, all all the parts. So they had to include all these parts. So they were peeking into other slides to see. <laughs> oh, I forgot that. You know, I forgot the internal address or. I forgot the re or I forgot the salutation. So, so there's this psychology happening. <laughs> it's kind of cool though, because you can kind of look at someone else's work in a way that's like, oh yeah, I gotta remember to do that. And it jogs your memory. And yeah. it, it, it's, it's a nice way to kind of have them collaborate, mm -hmm. but they're also kind of by themselves, eh? That's kind of cool. Um, I see that, Kanita, I saw you had your hand up. Let me know if you still want to respond or not, Kanita. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask like, um, uh, do you think like when you all of the students are working together in one document does it do you did you ever like felt difficulty on like loading and like because it takes a long time to load and if all of them are working um, at the same time so sometimes like um, yeah the connectivity and internet like does it uh, makes any difference like not, not in my experience, no. Uh, I was having connectivity issues lots uh, when at the up outbreak of the, of the pandemic and it was uh, due to my service provider. Mm. So I changed providers, of course, and I didn't have further issues, no. And my, my course is in the evening. So maybe that makes a difference perhaps. So this is from six to 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps, uh, but we never had any, any loss of connectivity. No, not that I can remember, no. Yeah. And students know that if they have any connectivity issues, they can either call in with their phone or use multiple devices to, to connect to the session. So once I was like in a webinar in which the presenter was like, yeah, the same. Uh, they had like different slides and everyone had to choose one slide and uh, just do some activity like drag icons from and um, 
uh, or write, do writing or something like that. So it would take like forever to like load it. And then if I would like type and then it wouldn't appear right away and like some, yeah, it was not going, doing well, yeah. Yes, yeah, so the, the number of students I have in a session typically is about 25. And in this example that I used, we've done many such um, activities, so this sort of activity. And sometimes, in, perhaps in one, a single slide, there were three people working on the same slide and um, in, in the same document. So this is the beauty of collaboration. Uh, and like, as I said, I fortunately, I don't have um, instances or examples or mm, well, okay. that kind of experience of loss of uh, connectivity. I can say I've also been on a slide with like 16 people and we were all working on something and it, nothing happened either, Jacqueline. So to your point, I think Google Slides are pretty good like that. Um, so thank you. I want to go on to Sandra though. Sandra's been waiting so patiently. Yeah, I was just going to say, I use chat, and I know that sounds kind of simplistic, but like, especially for writing, and like, so I'll say, you know, use the chat to give me your uh, overview sentence, or give me your introduction sentence, and then the students will write it in the chat, and then we'll all talk about it, and you know, the the students will give each other feedback. I'll give them feedback on their grammar. Um, we often do that with the writing, but also for other things. We use the chat a bit, and I know it's simple, but for this class, the chat seems to be really effective. So. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I've heard many people say that. It's already there. Don't break what's not broken. <laughs> If the chat is there, they love to use it. You ask a question and they're talking in there to one another and to you, why not? So thank you for that, Sandra. Uh, Gunnell also says um, they are still learning and it's a fun way to, to collaborate. And I think that's a really awesome way to close this off. Uh, and Gunnell says uh, she also uses the chat. Thank you, Gunnell. Uh, so that's a great comment for us to move forward, Loretta. So please. Sure, thank you. Yeah, and I use the chat box a lot, especially lately. So let's move on um, to our next question. Have you explored, um, okay, we did this, right? Uh, do you know what PBL, so project-based learning is? Have you ever used it in your course or courses? If so, describe the experience for you and your learners. Do you think PBL contributes to student accountability? If so, describe how. It's a long question, so take your time, Jacqueline. Long, long, <laughs> long, long question. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yes, so PBLA, as, as mentioned earlier, um, is, is, uh, is an acronym for project-based learning, which integrates collaborative uh, learning, critical thinking, um, and the communicative approach uh, to, to, to a lesson or to a project. And it's a means of authentic acquisition of language, um, and more than just language, more than just uh, language and, and in, a, in, an in an authentic way, sorry. With uh, project-based learning with PBL, um, again, as mentioned earlier, what we do is we ask a real world question and a meaningful question, a question that is not objective, a question that has no right or wrong answer it's a question about reflection and about a, a certain group of students addressing such a question and finding their own answer through research, through negotiation, through conversation, um, through listening, through reading, and then coming to terms, coming to an agreement as, as a team, as a group, and putting that into, a, uh, into a, the presentation. Uh, so they prepare their answers in groups, and as I said, they do research, they meet, they collaborate. Some I give them some time in class to do this group work. They will also find time in their time in their own time and to meet within their groups. So this is something they have to do outside of the class. So they will figure it out, and they do because they are motivated, they are driven to to complete their work. For uh, so they're all accountable. Each member of the group is accountable and takes ownership of their role in the group. So versus when doing individual work, 
maybe a student will not submit their work at, a, at some point or there's more room for excuses sometimes. Sometimes there are just excuses or maybe they were working, they couldn't finish their individual work. But when they're working as a team, that changes everything. They're in a group. <laughs> so they don't want to lose face with, with the members of their group and then as a group with the rest of the groups of the class. So this, this is a driving force that, um, well, that is motivating and inspiring as well. So they, they do inspire each other and, and, and push each other. In my experience, this approach uh, it bundles up many competencies and skills and um, into a single project, into a single project. So students enjoy the experience while they work on the project. Um, it's a social experience also to, to some extent, although this is online uh, engagement, but um, they do enjoy it because when they meet in their groups and I've listened in at some points when, when they're working in groups and they're just doing small talk or telling each other about what they did yesterday or their plan for the weekend. And especially now during COVID, they need this. They need this time and they need to talk to each other <laughs> um, quite a lot. Yes. Um, students also sharpen their tech skills by mastering presentation tools and other apps. This is great because these, these uh, skills that they pick up on and, and, uh, and hone um, will, will be valuable tools for them. Again, in the workplace or in further education or at home. Um, so in my classes, I actually teach them how to use Google Slides, how to use uh, well, Google Docs, how to collaborate, what to watch out for. So these are, this is some of the basic training that we do at the beginning of the course usually, so that they're equipped with, um, with how, to, uh, how to go about this. PBL is a win-win experience because in addition to what has been mentioned um, as benefits for students, um, instructors, so us, we are facilitators and guides um, and we step in to support our students when needed. So we're not so much teachers, so in a unidirectional way, so we're not delivering content, we are guiding. We're guiding our students and facilitating uh, their work through the project. Um, we let learners steer and gear their learning. So they choose what they're researching, what they're outlining, what they're building. Sometimes they're building surveys within this project and they survey uh, a number of people from maybe from their class or their friends and they come in with the results. They build, they build their, their presentation with results of that survey. Um, and what else? Also, as instructors, we let learners, you know, I said, own, they own their learning through their effort and performance, and they feel proud, and, and they, build their con they build a lot of confidence. So most of our students are newcomers to Canada, and this is something that they really, really need. So self -being, a, feel, a feeling of self-confidence and building confidence, and, um, and this is something that, uh, that they do uh, actually uh, achieve through, through project-based learning. That was a quite long, quite a long answer. Yeah, but it was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Jacqueline. That was a lot of information to take in, I have to say, but when you were mentioning it and describing it, I can really envision what you were seeing, which was awesome. Um, so um, you talked a lot about accountability. I think that Chris also mentioned accountability earlier too. That's a really interesting topic. I'll leave it at that. Let's see if anyone has their hand up. No one yet, and I don't see anyone in the chat yet either. It's just, it's okay. Oh, so Gunnel mm -hmm. says she's, okay. never, um, she's never used PBL, uh, project-based, but she's used task-based. That's an interesting mm -hmm. one. They're a little bit similar, eh? It's mm -hmm. really interesting. Yes, yes, they are. Yes, they are. So what, what a project actually does is it, um, it bundles up a series of tasks. So there are multiple, it's as if you took several tasks and you put them together into a project. Got so it. the whole project is, um, is real world. So it is, it is task-based. It's um, highly meaningful. And, um, and, then, and then all those, so the skills that I haven't been mentioning. So for example, grammar skills, vocabulary, I haven't mentioned those at all. So those are present. They are present and they come up. And so as a teacher, as an instructor, what I do 
is I when there's a grammar point, a grammar concept, some grammar point to to uh, to elaborate on. So then I will teach it, Got but it. based based on what is required or what arises during uh, work on that project. You know so what project means? Not not as an end, but as a means to an end rather, mm -hmm. and context based. Yes. Yeah, what I was going to say is that project based really reminds me of getting students ready to actually go into the workforce or go to like further education or just independent living. It reminds me a lot of that. A lot of things like, for example, like researching a landlord and contacting them and then having to write a letter and having, you know what I mean? Like all those activities put together, it reminds me of like the real world. And like you kind of said, right, from task based to project based is it makes sense that that connection and it mm -hmm. like you said accountability right because once i can do this in a classroom i can go out and do it on my own now yeah That's and, they'll, cool. and they'll learn about contracts for example in the, in the case of uh, you mentioned landlord mm -hmm. they'll well, contracts will come up for sure yeah and they all want to know about contracts and uh contracts are everywhere agreements and contracts and uh so that the interviews just, well, yeah, yeah yes the interviews yes, yes. I remember when we taught our students to shake hands and now we have to teach them not to, right? <laughs> I teach elbows now. Elbows Yeah, elbows. yeah. Totally. Yeah, and this is what we'll be talking about in our next question, actually, um, because it is connected to, um, to us working in groups. So let me share my screen with you. Yes. Um, and um, so, yeah. We're asking you, all of you, to think of a project you could assign your students, so this is our group work, in the module you're currently working on. Share your ideas on how you could use PBL for this project. So I'll let that sink in for a bit and then... So can I just say something? Uh, sure, please, Florida? please do. Yeah, so before going into, into your breakout rooms, uh, just remember that in project-based learning or PBL, what we do is we, we, we have to, we have to um, think of a question. So this is a central question that has no right and wrong answer. It should be related, if we, if we wanted to, to the module we are working on, of course. And we can envision what the results might be so we there should be we should build a schedule um, through the the uh, the work during, on this project. So there there should be a schedule and some kind of outline. That outline should be flexible because different things will arise during. It's a process. It's a journey. The project is a journey. Uh, so we should be open, open minded, and open to small adjustments and tweaking things as as uh, the schedule moves along. Um, but the question should be a meaningful question, a question that should get students reflecting and wanting to research and find evidence and support for their answer uh, to, to such a question. Mm -hmm. So for example, a recent question that I used in, in, my, in my course was a question asked by a, a famous political leader, which was, uh, is, is COVID-19 a blessing in disguise? Okay, so well, students had to come up with uh, yes or no or maybe, and but why? Why? In what ways? Was it a blessing in disguise or was it not? Or is it or isn't it? So that's just an example. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, just a quick note, some of us are not working right now. So if you want to make a pretend module up in your head, that's perfectly fine. Or maybe you could just listen to others, maybe try and piggyback off of their own module if you need to. That's not a problem at all. So I'll be putting you all in breakout rooms. You'll notice you're gonna leave this main room and go into a smaller room with a group of people. If the conversation flows, let it flow. If it doesn't, I can always hop in and get it sparked for you guys. Uh, so I'll be putting you into breakout rooms right now. Okay, everybody? Welcome, welcome back, everybody. It's Hello, a slow process. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Kunal. Yeah, you're back. Yeah, you can come back early. That's why. So if you come back early, some people are still in there. Yeah. So, Kunal, how was it? Did you guys have a good chat? Yeah, it was a little challenging, but we find a solution. And I think we have some sort of an answer. Nice. So why not? Why not? We, I love we're it. Good. We're good. That's great. Everyone else, how was your breakout room sessions? I want to hear about them. 
did you choose a leader? <laughs> but everybody a, can talk, right? Yeah. Question. I never thought about that. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Hello, hello. I think we have everyone back now. Yeah, okay. Welcome back. How, I want to know if a couple people want to give us their experience. How were the breakout rooms? Was it quiet? Was it chatty? Curious. <laughs> No comments yet? Oh, that's okay. Um, Gunnel says good. Thank you for letting us know, Gunnel. So maybe I'll pass to Loretta. We'll go to our last question. Gordon says it was okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we come to our closing questions for tonight. And the big question is, what do you think can happen if learners are not engaged? And I think that happens a lot more now. Consider all the stakeholders, consider learners, instructors, managers, and the language program itself. What do you think can happen? Jacqueline? Yes. So um, when our learners are not engaged, uh, so what can happen? They will become, uh, well, what obviously comes to mind is demotivation, frustration, boredom. Uh, demoralization, um, they might even drop out of the program feeling helpless and useless and feeling they're wasting their time. Um, so um, I think we need to empower them, empower our, our students, and uh, make them truly feel again accountable, this is the word I've been repeating a lot through the session, um, helping them build self-confidence, grow wings, they need, we need to, I think, well, I feel as an instructor, I need to help them grow wings as newcomers to Canada and equip, equip, equip them, sorry, with the tools they, they need to, uh, to build that uh, self-confidence, um, to develop, develop themselves personally and professionally and sculpt their new life in Canada, shape, give it shape. Um, instructor's sense of self-worth and performance will be impacted uh, if learners are not engaged. So we will see, this is contagious. If we see that our learners are not uh, really in the class, they're not participating, they're not taking part, we will not uh, feel uh, fulfilled either as instructors and our performance will at the end of the day will, will be impacted, yeah. Um, as to the language program we teach in, its reputation will weaken to some extent or in, and in different ways and to different degrees, if learners drop out, especially, uh, because they will likely broadcast this and their communities and potential clients will be drawn uh, to other providers. So students will speak to their friends, their family members saying, well, this course I'm taking or this course I took, uh, you know, uh, all we do is this or all we do is grammar and it's boring and it's this and it's, I'm not engaged. I'm not talking to anyone, only the teacher speaks. So that kind of thing. So it's important, and I think that it should be top of mind that we we keep students engaged as much as possible. And to me, engagement is having them work together, work in groups, collaborate. We will have students who are not um, very keen on doing that because maybe they don't have the tech skills, they don't feel that they have the technology skills, or they're shy, or they're introverts. That's fine. So we have to strategize and um, uh, maybe sometimes think of how we build our groups. It could be in a random way sometimes and not other, other times. Maybe we build our groups uh, strategically, <laughs> uh, just catering to those students that we have in the class who are a little bit hesitant and reticent to, to working with others. And maybe they come from more traditional uh, classrooms in which the teacher is the speaker of the class and content is delivered in a unidirectional way. So we do have to cater to, uh, to, to this situation, yes. Thank you. That's all I could say. If there's anyone else who'd like to share their voice, their opinion. Yes, please let us know. Raise your hand if you'd like to give um, a comment. Oh my gosh, I forgot that word. If you'd like to give a comment. It's a big question, I think. Like I was just thinking about my own experience. And I know that a lot of what happens, especially at gov government funded language programs, has to do with the students, the amount of attendance, and that comes down, down sometimes to engagement. So it's a very big question, I think, an important question too. 
Uh, okay, we have a message in the chat. Uh, Gunnel says, sometimes if there's not enough motivation or sometimes students are, aren't interested in the topic, then that can lead to them not being engaged. And I think that's a really great point. How can we bring lessons or how can we bring projects or tasks or teach things that are important and relevant and motivate students? That's an awesome point there, Gunnel. It is, it is. And we have one minute left. So it actually is a big question and discussion to, to bear in mind. It's food for thought, actually. Right? So we really have to think about what happens if they're not engaged. Um, so thank you, everybody. And thank you, Jacqueline, for all the work you did. And thank you, everybody, for all the amazing examples and materials you shared with us. We really learned from all of you. Thank you, everybody. Here is Jacqueline's contact information, um, her email address and her LinkedIn address. And um, we're more than happy to have had you all here tonight on a Saturday evening.